So we've been for some time sort of using our memory verses as a jumping off point for our lessons on Sunday morning. And so you've read the memory verse this morning together as a congregation. And so we're going to spend some time with this morning. I want to put it in some context. Jeremiah was a prophet of God. He began reigning during the days of Josiah the king. Josiah was this young man who came king at eight years old and he started all this reform, sort of called Israel back to God. They did all right during Josiah's life, and as Josiah died, other kings would take over and not do so well. So Jeremiah is sort of a long book in some respects. You're somewhat known, Jeremiah, as the lamenting or weeping prophet. He kept on talking about what was going to happen if God's people didn't stay faithful to him. And he kept giving them this warning. And by the end of the book of Jeremiah, Jerusalem has fallen. The city has been sieged. It's been looted. God's best and brightest people have been taken away into captivity. And Babylon is sort of the big force in the world at that point in time. And so it's just a tough book. And a lot of tough content in there. Because you see that God loves his people and he keeps calling them back and calling them back and calling them back. And sometimes they'll stay faithful for a little while and then sometimes they wander away. But then you had this great promise that God says is, you know, I've got this promise for you. And I want you to hear it because no matter what's fixing to happen or preparing to happen or it's going to happen, I want you to know that it doesn't really change my plan for you. And so this is the plans I have for you, God says. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And this was true for Jeremiah's day, and this is just as true today. Some time ago, someone gave me this verse and a little plaque, and I've got that plaque in my office on my campus at Tech. And I can't tell you how many times people said, that's one of my favorite verses, that's one of my favorite verses. People noticed it, and I said, it is mine too. And so this is a promise of God that spoke back in the days of Jeremiah, but it speaks just as truthful today to us as God's children today. That God has a plan for us. And I'm going to say this in the very beginning. God has a plan. He doesn't say, I've got plans for you. Okay? Necessarily, and his his plans are always changing. The plan he has for us is four parts. And these are the four parts of the plan. So the plan is to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope in a future. So we're going to spend some time in looking at this this morning. So... God has a plan for his people. His people have a choice in accepting his plan or rejecting it. You see, God is an all-powerful God, so he gave us to become free moral agents. That way we can make our own decisions. We can do what's right or we can do what's wrong. There's a consequence for both, but God's plan was for us to do what is right. When God created Adam and Eve and lived in the garden paradise, everything was great. There's no sickness, no death, no suffering. All the bad things in life we deal with didn't happen there. God wanted to coexist with mankind. But Adam and Eve sinned, and when they sinned, they broke the covenant with God. And then as a result of the sin, death, dying, suffering, working really hard, and, and all these other consequences this came as a consequence of the sin. But God's original plan was to be with his people, and his people to be with him, and that has not changed. Man changed it when he rebelled against God. And so let's look this morning at Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6. It says, in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. And so if we live lives that acknowledge God and how we conduct ourselves in our relationships and what we say, do, hear, eat, touch, whatever. If we think about what we're doing in a way that honors God He's going to keep us in the path according to his plan. And so this is a challenge for us. This was one of our memory verse a few weeks ago. But if we just begin to think about living in a way that is God honoring. God honoring in our school. God honoring in a job. God honoring in our home. God honoring in our community. To live ways in which people say, you know, you're different than other people, aren't you? Not in that you live some haughty, arrogant way in front of other people, but that you just make good choices. And so this morning, as we go through, let's look at each one of these promises. So God's plan has these four parts. The first one is to prosper us. 
The things that we need, God provides. Now, there are people who like to preach this prosperity gospel. That you just love Jesus a whole, whole lot and you're going to get a whole, whole lot of money out of it. God blesses his people materially. And I think there's a real challenge with that because people like to think if I'm really good to God, he's going to be really good to me and he's going to give me what I want. That prosperity gospel is not really what God's talking about here. The fact that how God blesses us, yes, we can have material blessings. But the reality of it is that God provides for us in ways that we don't always acknowledge and imagine. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, 31 through 33, he says, therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For all these things, the Gentiles, that is the non-believers are seeking. For your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. Tyler spoke Wednesday night in the devotional about in John chapter 10. But Jesus says, I came that they may have life, may have it more abundantly. Some of you are living abundant living. It's not reflected in your bank account. It's reflected in the peace that you have in your heart because you know you're in the right relationship with the Lord Jesus. That is worth more than all the money in the world. Jesus said, what if a man gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what can a man really give in exchange for his soul? So when you think about what the value of your human soul is from God's perspective, it's worth more than all the money in the world. And if we should hold it in the same estimation and same value, that we would want to honor God by seeking first his kingdom. And Jesus says, and when you do that, you'll be provided for. You will prosper. God's plan is to bless us. God's plan is to provide for us. Now, the challenge we sometimes have at the church is because we see broken things happen in a broken world. We see that people truly are poor. We see that people truly are hungry. We see that people truly lack the necessity of life. But if we're really seeking first the kingdom of God... Guess what? We're going to be moved to help fix those things. We talked about Wednesday's not Bible study class about when we think about the model prayer that Jesus gave. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Part of the kingdom's responsibility is to make sure what's happening in the earth reflects what's going to happen in heaven. That people are provided for. Needs are met. We try to eliminate human suffering to the best of our ability. But God has a plan to be a provider for us. The Hebrew word Jehovah Jireh is found on more than one occasion in the Old Testament. But it means basically God provides. It's one of the divine attributes of God is that he's a provisional God. He provides for us. And so God tells Jeremiah and tells the people that I have a plan for you to prosper you, to make sure that you're provided for. The second point of God's plan is that he is not going to harm us. God loves us too much to let us alone when we need to be corrected. Those of us that can remember sometimes the correction we have as a child, and at the time it didn't feel too good, but remember afterwards the love, the encouragement. I thought it rather cruel that the church I grew up in had a huge poplar tree right outside the front door. Because I was introduced to the limbs of that poplar tree on more than one occasion. Believe it or not, I was not always very good in church. I would squirm and misbehave, and sometimes I had to be taken out, you know. And I remember my father taking it, and I remember I knew what was happening. And any amount of pleading was not going to change the reality. I was going to be introduced to that switch. But I also had a father who took me in his arms and comforted me. Because it probably did bother him to have to correct me that way. But you know, God is not intending to harm us. A true parent, a true guardian that loves a child is going to discipline them. Not to harm them. I don't buy this idea you have to break someone's spirit to shape and mold them. But you have to sometimes mold their will to do what is right and helpful and good for them. And so they need to hear this in Jeremiah's time because some bad things are fixing to happen. I mean, families are going to be broken apart and the city is going to be looted and the good stuff is going to be taken off and some bad things are fixing to happen. But they need to hear, this is not to harm them. 
This is to bring them back around to repentance. And so the Hebrew writer, as I was preparing for this lesson, I was really struggling to try to understand did the Hebrew writer have Jeremiah in front of him? Because so much of what Jeremiah is talking about, the Hebrew writer picks up in. And so the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 6, 5 through 11 says, And when you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure the chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you're without chastening, of which you all become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not the sons. Furthermore, when we've had human fathers that corrected us, we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father's spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chasten us as seemed best to them. But he for our prophet, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who've been trained by it. Sometimes I think we want to paint God as a vengeful God. You know, you know, striking us with lightning bolts. We want to sort of treat God in that image. The Hebrew writer says, that's not the image of our father. The image of our father is like a good father, a good mother, a good parent, a good guardian who disciplines their child, not to be mean to them, but because they love them. And the outcome of that is to help them to become more like God, to become more like a good citizen for the parent, perhaps, or or a good child, a, a good member of the community. But for God is to help shape us and mold us to be more like them. Now, sometimes the consequence of life is because of things we did ourselves. And we don't like that. Sometimes we have the consequences in this life of suffering because of things other people do. And we don't like that either. But our heart is broken sometimes when good people suffer the consequences of evil. God knows our struggles. The Hebrew writer says in one point that Jesus was tempted at all points like we are, yet he did not sin. So what I hope you're beginning to see, a, maybe a thread to come through, is that God's ultimate plan is seen and found in Jesus alone. You see, from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, they all point to one truth, that God has a plan. In this plan is Jesus. And when Jesus comes along, he begins to say, hey, folks, I'm the plan. When he was hometown of Nazareth and he went to the synagogue and he read, he says, "Okay, what you just read here today, it's about me. They were blown away. How could he profess such boldness? But this was God's plan. The third point this morning in God's plan is to give us hope. And one of the things we need to embrace this morning is that God cannot lie about this. In fact, God cannot lie about anything. He is unable to lie because God is truth. So, again, the Hebrew writer, thus God determined to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise of the immutability of his counsel. As I was preparing for the lesson, I thought, I don't use the word immutable. I can't hardly say it. Does anyone have a problem with multiple syllables? Immutable. Immutable. Immutability is what it says, but immutable is a concept. What does that mean? I took it to mean this. You can't stop it from being professed. How many of you got the TV remote? Okay. And it has a little button that says immutable. Okay. It says mute, right? Mm-hmm. But when Tammy says, turn the TV down, I can't seem to find the button, so it's immutable to me. <laughs> and I cannot stop it from being professed. Jesus said on one occasion, you better be thankful this person said something great about me because if I didn't, even the rocks would have to cry out. Right? So the Hebrew writer says it's immutable. The promise cannot not be proclaimed. 
You can't stop people from talking about this promise. The promise that God made in Jeremiah's day, the promise that God has made over and over again to his people. You cannot stop the mutability of his counsel. It cannot be muted. You can't turn it off. Confirmed it by an oath that the two immutable things, that which is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation. Who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered us, even Jesus, having become the high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So where's our hope found in church? In who? In who? In Jesus. In Jesus alone. We sing the song, in Christ alone my hope is found. It's a great song. Great song. Because it's a true song. You cannot stop it from being proclaimed that God has a promise to his people. Since the day the church was established, people are trying to stop it. The Jews told them to quit preaching in the name of Jesus. What did the apostles do? They prayed for more boldness and kept preaching in the name of Jesus. The church was persecuted. What happened? The church was spread abroad. We read and studied that. Night. Went down to Samaria. They took the church with them. For over 2,000 years, people would like to erase Christianity. We see it in our culture today. Everyone has rights for Christians. But you cannot stop God. And you cannot erase his promises. And you cannot erase his hope. Now, I've never done any sailing. I've been on a boat, and even a great big boat, you know. Not a shrimp boat, but a great big boat, okay. But an anchor does what? It holds the boat in place in times of storm. And what do you hold on to in the storms of your life? Jesus. He is the hope. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I don't know what you're going through this morning, but I'll tell you that you have hope. Because that hope is found in Jesus. He binds the wounds of the brokenhearted. He holds up the discouraged. He is with you. We have this hope. This is part of the promise of God. We are not hopeless. We have hope. So God's plans for us is to prosper us. God's plans for us is to not do us harm. And God's plans for us is to give us meaningful, real, true, honest hope. And the last part, the last one is to give us a future. Now, we are truly blessed now by being the kingdom of God. And I think sometimes we can get so focused in on, on the future that we sometimes don't realize what we have now. And what we have now is good. Amen? When you have sweet fellowship, when you have it, you believe that people have got your back. When you know that I don't have to go through tough times alone, I can reach out to my church family. I know when I'm going through a tough time, they're going to show up in different ways through prayers and cards and maybe food and, and whatever I need. They're there for me. I know that I've got the blessings of being part of the kingdom of God now. But there is a future promise that God says. You have a future. It's a future based upon what you know about God and how he's blessed you. And how he's been there to correct you sometimes when you needed it. But also about this hope that's found in Jesus. But this future. Again the Hebrew writer. By faith that he that is Abraham. Dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country. Dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob. The heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations. Whose builder and maker is God. Let me remind you a little bit about the story of Abraham. He was not a young man when he decided to sort of take God at his word. Apparently he was a good man. He had somewhat distinguished himself from the other people living in Ur. Of, of the Chaldean area today would be modern day Iraq. 
And, but he had distinguished himself amongst his neighbors. And God says, you know, there's something about this man I like. And I feel like this man is something, has something special. And so while most people are thinking their life is over, Abraham's life is really just beginning. Abraham is 80 years ago when God says, Abraham, I want you to leave home. Pack Sarah up. Pack your servants up. Pack your flocks up. And I want you to go someplace. And oh, by the way, Abraham, in the future, my future plans for you that your descendants will be like the stars in the heaven and the grains of sand on the seashore. You can't count them. You can't. This is an 80-year-old man who lived with his wife nearly as old, but didn't have any kids. But the God who has plans says, I've got a plan for you. And Abraham and Sarah <laughs> packed it all up and took off. But everywhere they went, God says, you see this land? He says, yeah, it's nice. He says, keep moving. It's not for you, it's for your descendants. You see this land? Yeah, it's nice. Keep moving. It's not for you, it's your descendants. He wonders his entire life. In fact, when his beloved Sarah dies, he has to buy a plot of ground to bury her in because they don't own anything. He gave up his stuff to follow God, and so he buys a tomb to put his wife in along the way. But the Hebrew writer says he was looking for the city that God was building. Now, Abraham knew that God's plan was beyond this world. He was looking for the next one. And so we begin to see this. And so the Hebrew writer says he did this. Then Jesus speaks truth, more truth into this in John chapter 14. Jesus is preparing to leave this earth. And he says this, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see, we get the benefit of reading John chapter 14. We get the benefit of reading the book of Hebrews. We get the benefit of Revelation. Understand that Jesus has ultimately always been the plan. In fact, Paul makes it pretty clear in the book of Hebrews that this revelation that Jesus is going to be, he is the blueprint for all that we should aspire to be. Book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 1, 2, 2. Therefore, we also, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witness, let us lay up every side the weight and sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that's set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, it's always been about Jesus. He is the plan. There is no plan B. There's no plan C. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and light. There's no one to the Father except through me. The Hebrew writer says, look to Jesus. He's the author and finisher of our faith. And God's plan is perfect. God's plan for you and me was made a long, long, long time ago. Here's what the Ephesian writer Paul says. Blessed be the God and the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So the plan that God talks about in the days of Jeremiah is this one, right? It's in Jesus that began where? Before the foundation of the world. I don't think God ever said, oop, that didn't work out. Let me try something else. Oop, that didn't work out. Let me try something else. God has always planned redemption through Jesus Christ. Before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Having predestined us to adoptions as son by Jesus Christ himself. According to the good pleasure of his will. To the praise of his glory, his grace. By which he made us acceptable in the beloved. 
God wants us to have hope. And it's not wishful thinking hope. It's the hope of assurance. It's the anchor that holds you in place when the storms of life come. And to let us know the future. Brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors. God has a plan for you. It's a plan he's had for all of mankind. To cover them with his love. To extend his mercy. To prosper them. Physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. To correct us. His word gives us guidance for correction. Paul says for a proof, correction, for instruction of righteousness that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's what God's word does to us. And John the Revelator gets to tell us a little bit about that in the book of Revelation. And one of the great things he talks about in the book of Revelation about heaven, all the former things that caused us pain, suffering here, they're gone. And they don't exist anymore. That God makes that like it was in the beginning. Where he should be their God and they shall be his people. And he wipes away every tear from their eyes. You see, this morning we invite you to accept his plan for you. You have to acknowledge Jesus. You have to confess him as being your savior and God's plan. You have to put him on in baptism. Because his blood was shed for you and his blood becomes represented to us today through the water of baptism. As John saw blood and water coming from the side of Jesus when the side was pierced, this got us linked together. John said there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. These are three that bear witness in the earth, the water, the blood, and the Spirit, and these three are one. So we invite you this morning, if you've never done that, we invite you to take this opportunity to do it. But the opportunity is not limited at the close of this song. The opportunity is always open. You grab me, you grab Jeffrey, you grab Tyler, grab one of the elders. And listen, I want to do this. I want to do what he's talking about. I want to have a hope. I want to be part of the God's plan. I want to understand this, this future that I have. If you're here this morning, you've been discouraged and you forgot God's plan for you. We are here to encourage you, to pray with you, to... to to help build you up, to help strengthen you. And we will do that with you this morning. Chris has chosen a song. We're going to sing a few verses of this song as a space and time to respond. But again, you can respond at any point in time. Won't you come if you need to at this point as we stand and sing?